by La Dorato on April the 27th, and that will take place in the Art Lab. Uh, but today I have the uh, great pleasure and the honor of introducing Professor Jane Gallagher. Uh, for better than three decades now, Professor Gallagher has been a leading, indeed, a pioneering figure in theory, and especially in psychoanalysis, feminism, uh, and photography, and, and, and. It was no overstatement to say that she played a crucial role in making these fields what they are today. Her reading Lacan in 1985 was a major, major book that helped make Lacan the central figure. He became literary studies, and her contributions to feminism have been just as decisive. They include The Daughter's Seduction, Feminism and Psychoanalysis in 1982, around 1981. That's not the date of the publication, it's the title, <laughs> Academic Feminist Theory in 1991, and Thinking Through the Bottom in 1988, just for example, have helped establish the terms for feminist inquiry. Uh, to my mind, one of the most remarkable features of Professor Gallup's work is his challenge to academic and scholarly writing. For Professor Gallup integrates often theory with personal anecdotes and elements of memoir to produce works that are as original and compelling as they are rigorous. Uh, and in this style, as it were, uh, we have works such as Feminists Accused of Sexual Harassment from 1997, Anecdotal Theory from 2002, and Living with His Camera, 2003. Uh, professor Gallup is Distinguished Professor of English and Comparative Literature at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and her title today is, right here, The Phallus and Its Temporalities, Sexuality, Disability, Aging, Please, Join me in the welcoming of Professor Jane Gallagher. Thank you, Jan, and thank you all for coming. Over the last decade, there has been a flourishing of writing at the intersection of disability and sexuality studies. Theoretically bold work informed by queer theory that radically challenges normativity and militantly asserts bodily difference. My current book project owes its inspiration to that body of work, sometimes called Crip Theory, to writers like Robert McRuer, Eli Clare, and Riva Lehrer. Unlike the work that inspires me, however, my project includes in its intersectional focus not just disability and sexuality, but also aging. It is generally recognized not only that disability and aging studies frequently have common cause, but also that there is a wide swath where the categories of disability and aging bleed into each other. For example, Michael, Michael Barrobay, a leading figure in disability studies, writes, the fact that many of us will become disabled if we live long enough is perhaps the fundamental aspect of human embodiment. In such a statement, disability uh, becomes pretty much synonymous with aging. Statements like this are found everywhere in disability studies suggesting a widespread recognition that disability cannot be separated as a category from aging. Yet, despite the frequency of this gesture, there is little critical or theoretical work that draws from both disability and aging studies. My current work has the good fortune to benefit from both of these critical traditions. The focus of my book is, in fact, the swath of experience that could be equally understood either as disability or as aging, the experience of what I will call late onset disability, disability beginning in the middle years or beyond. My particular subject is how late onset disability is lived sexually. My book will trace how late onset disability is lived as a threat to one's sexuality and to one's gender, 
but the book will also trace how sexuality survives and transforms in the process. A sexuality becoming, in these older, less able subjects, more perverse from a normative standpoint, more deviant from an ageist, ableist standpoint. Taking its anti-normative audacity from queer and especially crip theory, my current work explores and celebrates the perverse sexuality of the no longer young, no longer fit. While disability studies has generated so much lively queer theory and vice versa, there is virtually no work at the intersection of queer theory and aging. Yet there is, in fact, an obvious place where the two could easily and productively hook up. For more than a decade, the most influential trend in queer theory has been the exploration of what is called queer temporality. Scholars as diverse and as influential as Judith Halberstam, Lee Edelman, and Elizabeth Freeman, to name just three, have brought the resistance to normativity and the valuation of alternative lives that characterize queer theory to bear on various aspects of temporality. A queer angle on temporality has obvious relevance for aging, which is all about temporality, which is literally the lived experience of temporality. Yet although theorists of queer temporality have focused on childhood and adolescence, and despite the obvious relevance, there is virtually no work applying queer temporality to aging adults. The concept of temporalities in this project and in my title arose from the application of all this wonderful theorizing of queer time to the question of adult aging. The title's inclusion of the phallus, on the other hand, is, I imagine, more surprising, more troubling, and needs more explanation. This is especially true because the notion, dear me, the notion has fallen out of favor in the last 20 years of theorizing sexuality. As someone who, decades ago, contributed to the feminist critique of the psychoanalytic concept of the phallus, I was surprised to find the term suggesting itself as I moved into my current subject. On the basis of the work I have been doing, I believe the reintroduction of the notion of the phallus, denatured by three decades of queer theory, has a substantial contribution to make to our theorization of sexuality as lived in and over time. I thus find myself returning to texts by Sigmund Freud, Jacques Lacan, and Judith Butler to craft a usable notion of the phallus with emphasis on its temporalities and with application beyond androcentrism. In this exploration of a viable phallus, Butler's 1992 article on the lesbian phallus, in particular, points in a valuable direction not taken up in queer theory since then. In psychoanalytic theory, the phallus is conceptually inseparable from castration. This makes the phallus an essentially temporal concept. The phallus is what one had in the past but lost, or what one has in the present but fears losing in the future. This is the normative temporality of the phallus, that the phallus has been or will be lost, that the phallus is imbued with pastness, whether in the present or in the future. This overwhelming pastness of the phallus, its insistent connection to loss, even when it is present, is what we call psychoanalytically castration anxiety. Both late onset disability and aging are experienced as threats to one's sexuality and to one's gender, regardless of the gender with which one identifies. This sense of impending loss, a loss tangling together gender and sexuality, can best be understood, I propose, as a form of castration anxiety. The psychoanalytic notion of castration anxiety is thus useful for thinking about how aging and late onset disability are lived sexually. In the standard narrative we call castration anxiety, once the phallus is lost, it is lost forever. In addition to outlining this normative temporality, my project explores other temporalities of the phallus, alternatives 
alternatives to the lose it once and for all normative temporality, alternatives to the phallus's insistent relegation to the past. In addition to articulating the phallus as a temporal concept in its traditional psychoanalytic formulation, this book tracks alternative temporalities where one could move from castration to phallus as well as in the other direction, where the lost phallus is surprisingly regained or where the phallus might appear not only in the past but as a promising future. These alternatives participate in the promise of queer temporality and may even lead to queerer phalluses and less anxious castrations. The temporality of castration anxiety is the scenario of an impending future losing it once and for all. As it turns out, this is the prospect we find over and over, both in late onset disability and in midlife aging. This is the temporality that Margaret, Margaret Morgan Roth Gallette, scholar of midlife aging, calls the decline story. Connecting Gallette's decline story to the psychoanalytic notion of castration anxiety is central to the theoretical underpinnings of my current work. In her 1997 book, Declining to Decline, Gallette fleshes out the concept of the decline story by telling about the debilitating back pain that befell her at age 49. Her story is a good example of my book's particular focus, a disability whose onset arises in midlife, an experience that can be equally understood as either disability or aging. Although as a scholar of aging, Gallette understands her experience through the rubric of aging. She writes of what this late onset disability means to her. I had been a strong, active woman. What a wonderful thing to be. I was proud of my strength, and the things that enabled me to do gave me a lot of pleasure. That is what I lost. When you can't do what you once liked to do, whatever that is, you fear you're becoming a different person. This fear you're becoming a different person is what I would call castration anxiety. She goes to see an orthopedic surgeon who tells her, you're not an old woman, but you have to be careful. You can't do the things you did when you were young. The visit to this doctor leaves her in a state of abject loss. It took me only a few hours to figure out that I had just gotten the worst news of my personal life, she writes. I extrapolated from the nerve pain I had been feeling. Whenever that began to worsen, my workday would gradually shorten. I would slowly become disabled and dependent. I was plunged into planning my suicide. The doctor pronounces, you can't do the things you did when you were young. The patient hears that, imagines a future of progressive decline, and is plunged into planning her suicide. Gallette's book teaches us that such moments of entrance into catastrophic loss typify our culture's construction of aging. Gallette is lucky enough to consult another doctor who gives her a different story about the same diagnosis. This second story allows her some distance from the decline story the first doctor pronounced. In her life and in her work, Gallette devotes herself to declining to decline, to resisting the cultural dominance of the decline story. The chapter on her midlife back pain ends thus. Chronic suffering takes different forms. If we ever begin to listen, the sufferers will have a lot of alternative stories to tell. Inexorability doesn't express the way our waves of knowledge come to us, the way we discover our private response at the same time we endure what feels like bodily injustice. In my current project, I join Gallette in listening to these alternative stories, stories that can provide alternatives to what she here calls inexorability, which is another name for the decline story, which I recognize as another name for the standard temporality of castration. By drawing together the various temporalities of castration encountered in these alternative stories, my book aims to lay out a vision of sexuality that is insistently temporal and a temporal sexuality that is not normatively tragic but multidirectional, holding open the possibilities of queer phallic surprises and post-castratory delights for older and less able adults. The texts I consider in this project span a range from literary fiction to academic theory. In my search for alternative stories, I pay special attention 
to writing from critical aging studies and crip theory that combines personal memoir with critical theorizing, a combination I have elsewhere called anecdotal theory. Gallette's inclusion of her personal story in her academic critique of decline is an example of this from aging studies. The alternative stories I discuss in the next section of this paper are examples from crip theory. The rest of what I will present to you today consists of two sections from the book I am working on. Both sections are from a larger chapter entitled High Heels and Wheelchairs. As you might imagine from the title, the chapter focuses on mobility issues, more specifically on issues around walking and prosthetic apparatuses. The first section I will present here is entitled Gender and Disability. The second is entitled The Phallus in the Wheelchair. Eli Clare's Exile and Pride, first published in 1999, one of the first books to combine queer and disability perspectives is now a classic text of crip theory. Claire teaches us to think the intersection of gender and disability. The mannerisms that help define gender, he writes, the ways in which people walk, swing their hips, take up space with their bodies, are all based upon how non-disabled people move. A woman who walks with crutches does not walk like a woman. A man who uses a wheelchair does not move like a man. The construction of gender depends not only upon the male body and female body, but also upon the non-disabled body. For my chapter, High Heels and Wheelchairs, I am, of course, particularly interested in Claire's focus on gender and walking. Claire's, the way in which people walk, swing their hips, makes me think of Riva Lehrer talking about walking and the norms of femininity in her wonderful 2012 text, Golem Girl Gets Lucky. She should sway with a spine strung in a sinuous rosary of bones, writes Lehrer. She should undulate with a hide and seek of the hips and the breasts. In Lehrer's sense of the disabled body's exclusion from gender norms, she notes how her viewpoint is at odds with a certain feminist idea. Women's studies has taught us to see the damage caused by rigid gendering, but there is a different kind of confusion and hurt caused by its absence, when it's clear that you're not being included because you've been disqualified. Disabled women must continually claim their gender in the face of active erasure. Claire and Lair give enough of their personal stories in their writing that we both that we know both are lifelong non-normative walkers. Their experience as thus excluded from gender norms results in a particularly valuable reconsideration of gender, especially because both are deeply familiar with feminist theory. Both recognize the truth of the feminist critique of rigid gendering, but insist on amplifying and altering that from the perspective of disabled gender trouble. As valuable as Claire and Lair are for explicating the relation between gender and normative walking, their temporality is not the one I'm concerned with here. For my purposes, I am drawn to a group of writers whose crip gender trouble comes upon them in adult life, wreaking havoc upon their already formed gender identities. I will here cite three of these writers, not only because they display the temporality of late onset disability, but also because the gender identities threatened by their disabilities are not male-female, but butch-femme, queer gender. In a 1992 collection of butch-femme writings, I found Mary Frances Platt talking about wheelchair use and femme identity. As lives go, mine changed, she writes, slowly at first and then more dramatically, Recurring back pain and limited range of motion, soon after came decreased mobility. I began to use a three-wheeled power chair. The more disabled I became, the more I mourned the ways my sexual femme self had manifested through the non-disabled me. Let us note the temporality of Platt's story. Her life changed, a slow decline ending in a wheelchair. Platt entitles her little essay, Reclaiming Femme, again, because she frames her difficulty claiming femme identity after disability 
as a repetition of an earlier difficulty. The 70s brand of white feminism had me trimming my nails and cutting off my hair. Soon I was outfitted in farmer jeans and high tops. Eventually, I pulled the pieces of my being back together and proclaimed boldly, I am a working class lesbian femme. So I had maybe six years of unleashing my seductive femme self when, as lives go, mine changed. Fighting against the loss of femme identity because of her disability feels like a repetition of her fight against the 70s feminist rejection of that identity. I identify with Platt's relation to 70s feminism and even more with her mourning her femme self. But what I love most about her essay is the sexy twist she gives to the image of the wheelchair. I hang out more with the sexual outlaws now, you know, the motorcycle lesbians who see wheels and chrome between your legs as something exciting. <laughs> An essay published seven years later in a collection of lesbian writing on disability tells a similar story of femme identity threatened by disability. Like Platt, Sharon Waxler has chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome, but Waxler also has multiple chemical sensitivity. She feels a similar threat to her femme identity, but not because of mobility issues. When I lost the markers of femme identity, she writes, I missed them terribly and wondered if I was still femme. One of the most upsetting losses was makeup, specifically lipstick. Waxler's loss throws her into a struggle with gender identity. It is this loss that threatens gender identity that I am here calling castration. While classic psychoanalytic theory believes castration is the loss of masculinity, this lesbian femme writing suggests that one can also experience the loss of femininity as castration. Thinking of lipstick, I find myself thinking about the beautifully phallic classic lipstick tube. In her essay, Waxler prefaces her own dilemma with a story of another lesbian confronting disability. A year before her own fall into what she calls the deep, murky waters of illness and disability, Waxler attends the monthly Femme Butch Rap at the Gay and Lesbian Health Center. I remember one woman in particular with soft red hair, Waxler recounts. She said she had a disability and it made her question her identity as Butch. Wasn't the Butch supposed to be the doer? The one who says, let me get that for you, honey? I remember thinking, I guess that's not a problem if you're femme. That last line is ironic because this recollection is the lead-in to the problems disability poses for Waxler's femme identity. But that's not a problem if you're femme is also true if by that we mean the relation between disability and being the doer. While both butches and femmes experience castration anxiety in response to disability, our particular anxieties point to gender differentiated ways of being phallic. Classic psychoanalytic theory proposes that masculinity has to do with having the phallus, whereas femini femininity with being the phallus. Our reading of lesbian writing here might revise that as, while femmes are phallic because of how they look, butches are phallic because of what they do. A particularly moving account of butch confrontation with disability appeared in the 2003 special issue of the queer theory journal GLQ on disability studies. This remarkable text certainly echoes Waxler's redheaded butch in her sense that the butch is the doer. But whereas Waxler's butch does chivalrous, chivalrous things like get that for you, honey, in S. Naomi Finkelstein's text, the butch's doing is explicitly and graphically sexual. How can I be a butch without my hands, she writes. How can I fuck when my muscles shudder as a result? One of the worst things by far is that I cannot feel the nerves in her cunt or asshole as I used to. I cannot move deftly enough over her clit. I cannot bend my neck to eat her out or rim her. The issue of GLQ, where Finkelstein's text appears, is entitled Desiring Disability. I love this title for its promise of bringing desire to the place of disability. No text in the rich double length special issue does this better than Finkelstein's. I am tempted to quote way too much. The opening is flat out sexy. She is lying on my bed, ass up. Jesus, I love her ass. She has opened herself for me. 
That interjected Jesus speaks from the place of Finkelstein's desire. After two pages of hardcore description of sexual activity, disability makes its unwelcome ex entrance. If it is possible to fuck her as hard as we both want, then I am doing just that. My arm is at an angle that my neck with three bone spurs going into my vertebrae does not like. My body starts to shake, my arm and then my hand go numb. I am still fucking her, but I cannot feel the smooth inside of her anymore, and my neck is screaming in anguish. Finkelstein nonetheless succeeds in making her femme come. My back is in a spasm, but I ignore it. I finish fucking her through gritted teeth. She comes, she finishes. After describing in some detail the physical manifestations of her femme's orgasm, she writes, in my mind's eye, my own cock explodes as she comes. I get that much pleasure from her climax. In my mind's eye, my own cock explodes, she writes. This is surely in part why, in my attempt to understand queer modes of the phallus, I so value Finkelstein. Despite the detailed account of the butch's pain, the episode is sexy to read, with the exception of the final paragraph. Here's how the story ends. While she rests, I go into the bathroom to take a muscle relax and into the kitchen to get an ice bag. The next day, I have to go to the emergency room for Toradol, a major anti-inflammatory that leaves me unable to eat for two days because it makes me nauseous and gives me the runs, but it does take the swelling down. The ending of her story is literally anticlimactic, but the ending of the story is not the end of Finkelstein's text. Powerful as it is, the anecdote only takes us only takes up about a quarter of the text. The rest is not narrative, but thoughts about her life as a crip butch, which includes not only candor about her disability, but also insistence on her ongoing sexuality, on her persistent desire. Like Platt and Waxler, Finkelstein experiences her disability as a threat to her gender identity, but probably because her identity is butch, not femme, it is easier to hear that threat as castration. How is a butch supposed to stay butch when her body is not cooperating? I have felt emasculated by my disease. As I try to think through the temporalities of castration here, tracing the ways that adult onset disability affects the phallus, Finkelstein's text is particularly valuable to me. Like Platt, Finkelstein experiences the threat disability poses to her gender identity as a repetition. Platt, titling her essay, Reclaiming Femme Again, frames disability's threat to her identity as a repetition of the 70s feminist rejection of femme. Finkelstein connects disability's threat to society's disapproval of butch women. I have paid many a price for being butch. Hell, I have almost been killed more than once for being a butch. I have lived with all these sanctions and stayed a butch because of my fierce love for women, my need to be inside them but how can I be a butch without my hands? After all I have lived through and endured, I face losing the capacity to be butch. Damn, that has to be a bad joke. I'm interested in the temporality suggested by both Platt and Finkelstein. In their account, disability's threat to gender is a repetition. They experienced a similar threat long before disability ever appeared and their experience of the threat as a repetition allows them, in the face of disability, to, as Platt puts it, reclaim their gender again. Both Platt and Finkelstein end their texts by proclaiming their desire. Finkelstein ends, nothing that they did or that has happened, not the streets or abuse or being a crip has killed it. My desire is still intact. The beauty of desire in all its rawness and untamed hope still leaves my throat scratchy and dry, and it's the taste of glory. Platt ends, now my femme is rising again. This lesbian femme with disabilities is wise, wild, wet, and wanting. I read rising again as the mark of a certain phallic temporality, one that manifests as repetition. These stories of lesbian gender and adult onset disability are stories of castration, but the temporality is not one where castration, when it happens, is once and for all. It is where the phallus is lost and then regained more than once 
in a repetition, rising again. Platt, Waxler, and Finkelstein all tell stories of late onset disability as castration. All end by affirming the persistence of their desire. I want to contrast this phallic temporality with the standard one, where castration when it occurs is once and for all. The phallus in the wheelchair. While the previous section of my talk presents texts with alternative sexual temporalities, I chose the text for this section because it is such a clear and familiar version of normative phallic temporality, and because it quite explicitly and pointedly articulates disability with the phallus. If the wheelchair is, in our culture, the very icon of disability, the wheelchair is most famously linked to castration in D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover. In that 1928 novel, Lord Chatterley in his wheelchair is the castrated foil to the phallic hero, hero Mellers. Lady Chatterley's Lover gives us a particularly readable version of the standard castration narrative for adult onset disability. The novel displays a sort of symptomatic overemphasis on Clifford Chatterley's wheeled mobility devices, manifest, for example, in its repeating the same sentence almost verbatim in two succeeding chapters. In chapter one, he could wheel himself about in a wheeled chair, and he had a bath chair with a small motor attachment, so he could drive himself slowly around the garden and into the park. And in chapter two, he could wheel himself about in a wheeled chair, and he had a sort of bath chair with a motor attachment in which he could puff slowly around the park. Lady Chatterley's lover works to ensure that when we think of Lord Chatterley, we think of him in a wheelchair. I want to return to Lawrence's novel, a veritable treasure trove of aggressively normative sexuality. Returning to that novel, I discover an emphasis on temporality. For example, chapter two ends thus. Time went on. Whatever happened, nothing happened. Time went on as the clock does, half past eight instead of half past seven. Exploring the temporal dimensions in Chatterley will allow me to formulate the normative temporality of the phallus and will help outline alternative phallic temporalities. Lady Chatterley's Lover is a celebration of the most normative version of phallic sexuality. When the female protagonist gives herself to the phallic man, she, of course, becomes pregnant. When she rejects her husband because of his war inju injury, it is widely and repeatedly said that it is because he cannot give her a child. Although scandalous in 1928 for its explicit sexual scenes, this novel is a peon to the superiority of reproductive sexuality. It is a definite pleasure for me to juxtapose Lady Chatterley's normative phallus with the alternative queer phalluses I have found in lesbian writing. The novel's phallic hero, hero Mellers, in fact, expresses a particular animus for lesbians. It's astonishing, Mellers says, how lesbian women are, consciously or unconsciously. Seems to me they're nearly all lesbian. I could kill them. When I'm with a woman who's really lesbian, I fairly howl in my soul, wanting to kill her. Comments like this make me glad to locate the phallus in S. Naomi Finkelstein's lesbian <laughs> crypt butch mind's eye instead of in Mellers, who militates here and throughout the novel for the most normative reproductive sexuality in the name of the phallus. I admit to a bit of a revenge urge in relation to Lady Chatterley's lover. I read that book as a teenage girl in the 1960s trying to keep up with the sexual revolution. This was supposed to be liberating sexuality and it made me feel completely inadequate. <laughs> I was, to my horror, like all the women Mellers hated, not so much literally consciously lesbian as not properly complementarily responsive to his celebrated phallic thrusts. It was only many decades later, finding myself in a wheelchair, that I thought of returning to the book to look at Lord Chatterley, to wonder how his disability figured in this expression of normative sexuality. When I did return to the book, I found not only the normative view of disability as castration, but an emphatic sense of castration as a temporal mode. The novel opens thus. <laughs> 
Ours is essentially a tragic age. The cataclysm has happened. We are among the ruins. This was more or less Constance Chatterley's position. The war had brought the roof down over her head. We might recognize this as the classic modernist sense of the effect of the Great War. It is also what I am calling classic castration temporality. This is where the novel locates its heroine and its reader before it introduces any characters or action. Soon enough, it becomes clear that while the tragedy, the cataclysm, seems general in the opening sentences, it specifically refers to what happened to Constance Chatterley's husband. In the very next paragraph, we read, she married Clifford Chatterley in 1917. Then he went back to Flanders to be shipped over to England again, more or less in bits, the lower half of his body from the hips down, paralyzed forever, crippled forever, knowing he could never have any children, Clifford came home. Paralyzed forever, crippled forever. Forever is the temporal mode here. Its other expression is the never of never have any children. Because of his war injury, Clifford is a husband who cannot be a father. The effect of this on Lady Chatterley and in the view of the book is a generalized sense that ours is essentially a tragic age. When the narrator says we are among the ruins, the ruins are a generalized extrapolation from Clifford who is more or less in bits. As an aside, let me just remark that why a paraplegic is understood to be more or less in bits is itself noteworthy, not at all literal, but a striking figure. In bits is the opposite of whole. I would connect it to the Lacanian body in bits and pieces, which in Lacan's theory is the opposite of the body that can assume an upright position, the opposite of the body that can stand without assistance. Judith Butler reads Lacan's body in bits and pieces as an image of castration. Butler's rereading of Lacan could, I think, open to a crip reading of the orthopedic mirror stage. End of aside. Whatever we might think of Lawrence's set, sense of Lord Chatterley as more or less in bits, I want here to pursue the temporality of the novel's opening. The tragic age, the cataclysm has happened, paralyzed forever, crippled forever. This sense of general tragedy of forever that we find in the very first paragraphs of Lady Chatterley's Lover is what Margaret Gallette calls a decline story. To exemplify the decline story, Gallette quotes Gerald Early writing about his state of mind after a gallstone operation. I knew then, at that inexorable moment, that I had become finally and forever middle-aged. Inexorable moment, finally and forever. These are the markers of Gallette's decline story, the markers of tragedy of what I am here calling conventional castration temporality. Gallette discusses decline in relation to the entrance to middle age, an entrance understood as a tragic fall. Clifford Chatterley is, however, only 27 when paralyzed from the hips down. His story is not about aging, but about the loss of the ability to walk, to be upright, and to father children. While these are arguably two different modalities of loss, my point here is that they are confronted through the same temporality, the temporality of finally and forever, of the inexorable moment. Like the entrance to middle age, adult onset disability is framed through the dramatic temporality of forever. While middle age and disability might be two different modalities of loss, many people in fact experience them entangled together. Gallette's own personal story, for example, is of a back injury and the onset of chronic back pain as heralding her entry into middle age. Although Finkelstein categorizes her loss as disability, middle aging enters her account as well. That is the difference between me as a butch at 30 and me as a butch at nearly 40, she writes in her vivid account of becoming a crip butch. On the other hand, while Gerald Early categorizes his loss as entering, entry into middle age, he is actually describing an experience of illness and hospitalization. It is the insistent entanglement of a disability and loss of youth that indeed characterizes what Gallette calls the decline story, the dominance of a certain temporality. A third strand in this tangle, I would add, is the loss of sexual potency, attractiveness, sexuality, i.e., castration. In her struggle against decline ideology, 
Galette does not allow Early's story to remain in that inexorable temporality. She supplies the needed corrective. In time, Early returned to health, teaching in a prestigious writing career, Galette writes. Although he doesn't mention such things, he goes on to show that he did not remain utterly despairing. It would probably have been truer for him to write, I felt for that agonizing moment that middle age was going to be a tragedy forever. I was wrong. Just as Gallette insists that Gerald Earl, Gerard, Gerard Early actually had a diverse and full life after his dramatically declared inexorable moment, I want to return to Clifford Chatterley to consider what his life was like after his tragic loss. In particular, I want to look at his sexuality after paralysis. I want to look at how the novel describes the sexuality of the man in the wheelchair. In the last chapter of the novel, after his wife has left him, after she is pregnant by Mellers, thus after the inexorable has run its course, we find Lord Chatterley in the care of Mrs. Bolton. Their relationship has become increasingly sexual, although the novel shows nothing but contempt for this perverse sexuality. I take the liberty of quoting at some length. He would hold her hand and rest his head on her breast. And when she once lightly kissed him, he said, yes, do kiss me, do kiss me. And when she sponged his great blonde body, he would say the same, do kiss me. And she would lightly kiss his body anywhere, half in mockery. And he lay with a queer blank face like a child. It was sheer relaxation on his part, letting go all his manhood and sinking back to a childish position that was really perverse. And then he would put his hand into her bosom and feel her breasts and kiss them in exaltation, the exaltation of perversity of being a child when he was a man. The narrator expresses strong disapproval, really perverse, the exaltation of perversity. The disapproval issues from the perspective of normative sexuality. It is not that this isn't sexual. It is that this is a childish sexuality, what Freud, by the time Lawrence's writing, had famously called infantile sexuality, contrasting it with adult reproductive sexuality. In the early 20th century, Freud had established the correlation between perverse and infantile sexuality, and that is indeed what we see here from the perspective of the narrator's disgust. It is not that Clifford Chatterley has no sex life, but that his sex life is not normal. I am interested in the exaltation here, the word twice repeated and also bodied forth in all those exclamation points when the text quotes the excited Chatterley, yes, do kiss me. Exaltation, the state or feeling of intense, often excessive exhilaration and well-being, rapture, elation. Exaltation and euphoria both involve a sense of extreme personal well-being, but exaltation is the stronger and more elevated term. Exalt from Latin exaltare, to lift up from ex up plus altus high. Exaltation connotes intense pleasure, but with an emphasis on verticality. That uplift is particularly interesting in relation to a man in a wheelchair unable to stand. It is also, I would suggest, phallic. I find this passage sexy. Maybe it's just me, but I don't think that I'm the only one. Consider Mrs. Bolton having her breasts felt and kissing his great blonde body anywhere, only half in mockery. Mrs. Bolton was both thrilled and ashamed. She both loved and hated it, and they drew into a closer physical intimacy and intimacy of perversity. Although the novel portrays her as ambivalent, both sides of her response, thrilled and ashamed, suggest that she recognized this as sexual and responds sexually. Clifford Chatterley's narrative arc begins with his castration in the Great War and seems to continue as an inexorable decline. As the novel progresses, he loses more and more, fulfilling the loss inevitable from the beginning as his wife grows distant from him, cuckles him, and leaves to have a child by another man. But this late scene with Mrs. Bolton suggests a different phallic temporality, one where the lost phallus can return in another place. What returns is not the normative phallus, the one belonging to a man, not a child, not the phallus that can impregnate a woman, but a perverse phallus, one no less exalting. If we release ourselves from the normative hold of reproductive sexuality, we can enter into other phallic temporalities, 
where the inability to walk or get it up or be a man does not have to mean castration forever, where the phallus could rise again in the wheelchair or in the mind's eye. Thank you. connection to what titles like Reclaiming and Declining, um, in, in a kind of Lacanian sense of identity as itself a symptom, a symptom of a need for wholeness, a need for stability, um, a, as opposed to something that's always already elusive, always already impossible. And there was something about a lot of the crypt texts you were quoting that suggests well, here I am, wet, waiting, and wet, wild, and waiting. That that there's something now reclaimed and sure and stable about those identity positions. I wouldn't call them stable. I mean, that's what I was trying. That's why I was trying to emphasize the the temporality of them, right? Because I mean, that's a story in which she loses. She loses. So the identity we're talking about there is her femme identity. She loses it when she runs into '70s feminism. Then she works very, and she really loses it, and it's very painful and upsets her, et cetera. And then she works really hard to reclaim it, right? And she reclaims it, and then all of a sudden she loses it again because of her disability. And now she's trying to reclaim it again. And so there's no, there's no kind of permanence. It's this, it's this structure of repetition of loss and reclaim. And so, because I mean, the title of that is Reclaiming Femme Again. So that there's, I mean, there's this lot of repetition because there's not even twice. There's at least three times just in the title. So I think that I, stability doesn't work there. But it's, it, it's really about understanding a temporality in which there is like, Loss that includes loss, absolutely. This is, I mean, it's why I'm trying to put castration in there. But that is not about, but, but, but understanding that the notion that the loss is forever, is once and for all, is part of that tragic temporality of, of, of tragedy, which is, um, which is a kind of reading of a moment rather than a reading of actual temporality. Does that? Okay, I, I guess I was also thinking about Lacan's, you know, ideas of. of radical negation, the kind of things that Yale and Lovett pick up. Right. Absolutely insist on. Um, again, just, just thinking about the return to that place of claiming identity as femme or butch or, or sexual in some sense, in the face, perhaps, of a radical negation. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, and I don't know how to. I mean, I don't know how to answer that. I mean, it 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 it's certainly there is there is a kind of negativity and pessimism to Edelman's theory that is very different than the the kind of whatever up upbeatness of of my theory. Um, and but I don't think they're actually. I mean, it, it's like they're they're temperamentally different. I'm not sure that they're actually contradictory. I, Lee Edelman has actually read this and, and is, was one of the readers for my press and loves it. So I, so I know that he doesn't take it as like a threat to what he believes to be true, even though, I mean, so I, I'm not sure what, what to make of that. I, I have always been a sort of optimistic psychoanalytic theorist, and most psychoanalytic theorists are, are pessimistic and tragic, and so I'm not sure what that is <laughs> about. But it's, it's about, I mean, part of this is about, is, when, when I started to think about the relation between the phallic and the phallus and castration as a necessarily temporal, it's always a temporal relation, right? That's, it's about these kind of uh, about a temporality in which in which the phallus always moves toward castration. There's no right, and therefore, if you understand the t phallus temporally, then you are always in a world that always includes castration. Then I began to understand that there was. I also thought that there was something funny about a temporality that simply goes in one direction and never moves. That didn't seem to correspond to temporality as anyone I know thinks about temporality. And so then I began to wonder what would happen if you took a temporality of the phallus and castration and imagine it in structures that include repetition, 
rather than just you know going from one positive to one negative and then and then ending. And then I, and so then I started noticing these noticing things that both look like castration in these you know in people's responses to disability and to aging. Right, it just looked like the language of castration and and. And certainly there are people who think, for example, that in a Freudian point of view, aging is understood as castration, right? I mean, the, the castration anxiety is one of the, probably the best psychoanalytic way to understand the people's anxiety about aging and their anxiety about an, an onset of disability or illness, right? And so, and, and always in those moments of castration anxiety, it's, it's like, okay, this is it, I've lost it, and I've lost it forever. And, um, but, but so then I started reading and finding these other temporalities, and I got interested in that and wanted to try to hold on to the idea of using the phallus and castration, but imagine them in, an, in a different temporality. Yeah. Thank you. I really enjoyed that. It was fun. Good. Um, <laughs> I'm pro fun. <laughs> <laughs> Need more joy, more fun. Um, so I, I, this might just be because of what you decided to, to focus on from your, from your book, but um, disability is given to us in terms of movement. And so temporality, there's a temp movement of temporality, and then there's the movement of the wheelchair. I, just these are examples you, you, you tell us. So how does this shift if we think of other kinds of disability? And just off the top of my head, I think of like meant eyes, from the reason the belief of some kind of focus on eyes, I think Oedipus and eyes. I just wonder if other kinds of disabilities also shift or would that produce different kinds of problems? Well, I certainly, I mean, it, it is true that my focus is on, my focus in this chapter is on, on mobility, and this is the chapter that's most worked out. And I, excuse me, I didn't really think of the connection between mobility as movement and temporality as movement. So I, I never thought of that until you just said it. It's interesting to think about it. So I, do, I don't feel like by focusing on temporality, I'm focusing on movement. I feel like I'm focusing on temporality. So I, I thought that um, I think that what I'm talking about of, and, and it's why I really insist on separating late onset disability from disability that starts in childhood, which, which is a, it's mainly disability that starts before one has a gender identity, I think is really quite different. Um, but I didn't, didn't think it was particular, I didn't think that what I was looking at in terms of that temporal structure was particular to a particular kind of disability. I don't think it is. But I, you know, but so I don't know. I mean, I think because in this, in, in the material I gave you here, it's, it's about mobility. And it, you know, it, it, it also, it was, it was nice to, I mean, I, I have mobility problems, so that's part of why I was thinking about this. And I spent quite a bit of time in a wheelchair, so I, and then I started realizing that they use the wheelchair to stand for all disability. I mean, that's the, it's literally that icon, including displays that have nothing to do with mobility. Um, so it seemed, it seemed a nice place to begin. Um, but I hadn't thought that the structure I'm looking about as temporality is a structure of mobility. So, but it, it may be mobility in the abstract sense of just, you know, like understanding these things not in some kind of stable, essentialized way, but, but as changing over time. So I don't know. It's, I didn't really answer your question, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> Thanks a lot for that talk. I've been working on The Sun Also Rises. So uh-huh. <laughs> yes. There's a lot of clear parallels between uh, what's happening in those two novels. I wanted to ask, though, about um, you kind of gestured towards it at the end, but erectile dysfunction. Yeah. And whether you're talking more about that in the book. Yeah. About yeah, I have, I, hold, I have a whole chapter about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it seems Yeah, like and I'm working on it now. It seems to fit in well to the whole. It seems to throw an interesting twist on this, where you've actually got like these ads for Viagra, and you've got all these like smiling white men in khakis that are actually like uh, becoming, temp according to your model, temporally queered by this thing that they that had threatened that they had threatened to have lost forever, and now prosthetically became right. Yeah. Um, so. This is the chapter I'm kind of working on now, so I'll, I'll probably be less coherent about it <laughs> as, as those things sort of are, but it is definitely what I am interested in. And um, 
I'm not writing about the sum also rises, but I thought about writing about it. I'm, I'm actually in that chapter, the novel I'm looking at is um, uh, Philip Ross Exit Ghost, uh, which is about Zuckerman, very late, very impotent and sexually smitten with a woman. Uh, but um, so there's a couple of, I mean, I started doing a lot of really interesting reading at the intersection of um, sexuality studies and gerontology. There's some interesting people doing work. And in fact, a number of them are Canadian. So I don't know why. That's like the, be it's the best place to go for that intersection, turns out. So maybe I'll just stay here. Um, <laughs> it's true. It's, it's kind of crazy. But, um, and there are, there's some really good critiques of the new model that arose in the late 20th century of what's called forever functional. And that model arose before they invented Viagra, but it led to the invention of Viagra, which is that 100 years ago, the normative model, the normative life course model of sexuality and male sexuality is that you would become wise and sage and passionless at the end of your life. And that was understood as, you know, as a good thing and a happy ending to your life and all of that. And, uh, and therefore, um, the kind of diminishment in, uh, in erection at the end of men's life was understood as normative and, and, and regular and okay and, and a good sign and, and progress because you'd move toward maturity, right? And this was a kind of healthy maturity. And sometime in the late 20th century, that model shifted to what is called, uh, what people working on this call forever functional. So there's a kind of forever there too. And um, in that, and so a lot of people are kind of criticizing that model and talking about that and the idea that because it's, it's about a model in which aging is so bad, you're supposed to prove you're, not a, you're, you're, you're still a young man and you're supposed to do that. But aside from that, and the thing I am most interested in is, um, is the fact that behind that model and Viagra and everything is, uh, is an incredible assertion of, of what is called the coital imperative, which is the assumption that the only sex that matters happens to be the exact same sex that produces babies, which is to say penile vaginal intercourse, and that the definition, the definition, the absolute medical definition of erectile dysfunction is a penis that cannot get and stay erect long enough to uh, finish an act of coitus, right? So it's so so the centrality of that act as the only sexual act, and the marginalization of every other sexual act is inscribed in all of the medicalized discourse on erectile dysfunction. Uh, and so so there's some people who are working with uh, sexuality and particularly older men, but the, and gerontology, and actually uh, calling into question. The, this notion that you know that that male sexuality and its functional male sexuality is completely defined by its ability to perform this act, the uh, you know I mean so this is why so Nathan Zuckerman in in the Ghost Rider you know says I can't pleasure a woman and it's like crazy it's like it's like he doesn't know there's anything else to do I mean it's just just like like I mean I, I don't believe Philip Roth doesn't know that but that's like so he's like. He, Nathan Zuckerman is completely like, you know, assumes his castration, but what he assumes largely is this medicalized model of, uh, of late life male sexuality. And so I, this is, I, I, it's hard to stop talking about this because I, as I said, I'm in the middle of writing this chapter, but that's kind of like what, I, what I'm interested in is, is, the, is the, the, and also then the, what you have there still is if, is despite the fact that we supposedly live in an era in which normative sexuality is no longer reproductive, the fact that the only sex act that counts in the medicalized version of sexuality and in a lot of this treatment is, happens to be the only sex act that actually is reproductive means that we're actually still operating in an era of reproductive sexuality, which is being imposed on people who are way past being interested in reproduction, you know, even if they're heterosexual. Uh, you know, on a, lot, on a lot of men and women in their 70s and 80s, it's just like nuts. Right, so. <laughs>
Thanks for asking me. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your theorizing of temporality would affect how we might think about disability or aging and so forth in relation to the drive. I don't know. I haven't thought about it. Um, you, you, let's, can you help me or make um, some connections? Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, it's that the drive has a temporality that in a sense we are, well, unconscious of. Is it possible that the castration anxiety that surfaces in the modes of uh, physicality, temporality that you're discussing, is it in a sense what has to, the shift that has to occur is toward a temporality of the drive that actually makes it possible for you to do the kind of reclamation that you're talking about. That is to say, the drive is structured around repetition, but it's also structured around the sense of it being an excess that we have no control over, so the discourses of forever and so forth don't actually apply. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that certainly makes sense to me. It seems, um, I mean, I was, I was thinking not of the drive, I was thinking more about desire, because desire, even in the non lacanian frame, is the term that you keep finding, in, in, which is to say that on the one hand, there's this sense of castration, on the other hand, there's this persistence of desire. Right, and it seems to me that part of um, the, the kind of un undiability of desire or something like that seems to be part of what's what's going on and that's you know and trying to think together that but but I, I've always been very unclear about the relationship between the drive and desire which is probably why I don't quite know what to do with the drive in Lacan yeah. I don't mean in life I don't know about life <laughs> <laughs> somebody had their hand up two people did I don't know who was first about um, women who could not go through uh, a sexual awakening for religious and cultural reasons, um, and who have encountered mid to late life disability, how can uh, these individuals regain their sexual identities later in life? Is it possible to have their identities subsumed, like, uh, eradicated early on for whatever, whatever reason? I'm not sure what you're thinking about. It's, it's interesting. I, you must be thinking about some specific thing because it's. I, I, you're clearly not thinking about something I was talking about. I mean, except you're. you're so, so I'm. I'm just want to know a little bit more about what. Um, I mean, on the one hand, it sounds and I'm I, what it sounds like. Uh, there's there's an earlier pre disability loss of sexuality, suppression of sexuality, something like that. But you, you seem to be telling a story which is about disability bringing sexuality as opposed to, um, as opposed to losing it again. So I'm, I'm just not, I'm not, I'm not sure. Because the thing that I feel like is, is that, and, and, and that I would, would argue for, for what I'm saying here is, is that what I'm calling castration is, is always the, the entangled sense of loss of gender and loss of sexuality. And I think that even, you know, women who, for whatever reason, have you know, been trained to think of themselves as asexual still have a sense of gender identity and also have a sense of losing that in relation to disability. So um, I'm not sure where that, that leaves us. But I, but I would, I would want to, I mean, that, that's kind of part of how I'm under, uh, understanding castration anxiety. It's always, it combines a loss of sexuality with a loss of gender in this way. Could someone perhaps who identified as lesbian but could not express that identity and you encounter disability, is there a way that disability can help express that loss, um, not just related to your gender, but to sexual identity? I don't know. It's an interesting question. I mean, I, I found a lot of things in which people who are lesbian, or lesbians we'll call them, <laughs> who become dis... <laughs> dis <laughs> who become disabled later in life see a similarity between being lesbian and being disabled in terms of their, their kind of non-normative position. But that's really different than what you're talking about. So I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what to do with what you're saying. You're, are you thinking about something? Is there some, some story or some? 
And I, and I guess I don't have anything to say about it because I guess everything that I have been looking about is always about the moment of um, becoming disabled as a moment of incredible threat. Um, and not, you know, and then like it turns out that it's not the end of their life and, and various things, and that they continue to have sexuality and that they, you know, that whatever, they reshape it. But it's never about, not, none of the stories I'm telling, none of the stories I know are stories about disability as, as like a, just a gain. Yeah. Well, yeah, thanks. Um, first of all, thanks for the talk. That was really great. Um, but to, to go with what you just said, I think it dovetails with my question here as well. Um, because what I was wondering is I felt like, um, especially in the earlier part of your talk, you, um, you retold a lot of stories about this sort of gradual sense of decline that comes with um, late onset disability. Um, and what I really got out of that is this, this story of how there is a threat of one you know, moment of castration forever, but it plays out in a gradual narrative of losing one ability after another and sort of living through this decline daily. So I guess what I was wondering is when you when you introduce this regaining of the phallus or of sexuality um, that can come about in this narrative of repetition, or this temporality of repetition, um, is there a similarly gradual um, ascension, I guess? So there's a gradual decline. Is there another gradual period of regaining sexuality, sort of in steps and through daily um, acknowledgments of one's abilities and sort of experiences and things like that? So I guess at the end of the last question, you sort of said that you don't really have narratives about that. I'm wondering if um, you might reframe that considering kind of this, like instead of just, just narratives of uh, phallus or gender being built from disability, you know any narratives of it being rebuilt after um, the decline accompanying the disability? I think it's a really good question, and I, I don't think I could probably do it justice, but I, I like it and I want to think about it. So here's some of the things I think in response to your question, which is that you're, I think you're pointing to actually an even more complex temporality operating in my paper than I was aware of. Because, so in a lot of these narrative of progressive decline, the narratives of progressive decline are not actually um, sto the stories, they're not the experience of progressive decline, they're a moment of horrible imagining of, of the future as progressive decline. They're not, right? So um, Margaret Morgan Roth Galat goes to her doctor, and her doctor says this, and she says, and then in 10 years I won't be able to work, and then I, but that's all in a moment. It's not, it's not an experience of progressive decline. It's, it's, this, it's, it's imagining that this moment, which was only a little loss, is, gonna, is on its way to total loss, right? So, so one of the things that I need to think about is the relation between that fantasy narrative of progressive decline, which is experienced in a moment, in the moment of the onset of disability. And, and there's several versions of that. I mean, you're, uh, thank you for catching on that. So, so what is the relation between the, that fantasy temporality of the fact that, no, I'm not nothing yet, but I'm on my way to nothing, which is, which is the way the anxiety is experienced. And that's certainly the way middle aging works, which is, yeah, I'm not young now, but I'm not really old, but I'm on my way to old and dead, right? And it's, all, it, it's the fact that from this moment, whether it's you know, 40 or 50 or 35 or whatever, that first thing that makes you think that, and this is what Galette finds, it's not just that you realize you're no longer young and you, whatever, your back hurts or you, you know, have a little arthritis or whatever. It's that you imagine this is the beginning of something that is on its way to total, like, mindlessness, disability, and death. I mean, it's like, so that's, it's actually clearer in aging, but it also goes on in late onset disability because a lot of late onset disability, the narratives I've found, starts in which you're not totally disabled. You start by being a little disabled and you're imagining, and sometimes you are actually becoming. So that's the first thing, which is that to even think about these narratives of progressive decline, I need to figure out how the moment of castration anxiety produces narratives of progressive decline. And then in my, in my experience, at least some of these surprising returns of the phallus, in a, and it's always in a different place. It returns in a different place, which is you know, what the phallus would do. Um, <laughs> They're all, they tend to be sudden. They're not progressive. You don't rebuild a phallus. <laughs> you, don't, you can't like 
you know, piece by piece. You can't build the phallus in bits and pieces. That's the thing about the phallus. It just, it just springs up whole. <laughs> Um, so, so that it's not, it's, it's, there's not a progressive improvement, but there's not really a progressive decline. That's the thought. So. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much. Um, I guess my question is also kind of piggybacking on the previous two. So I, if you're tired of answering it, I can totally understand. Um, <laughs> well, if it's the exact same question, I'm tired of <laughs> Well, you, you were talking about in your, in your um, talk on alternative stories that pain and suffering can open up. And, and the ones you really focus on, obviously, there's the inexorability one of the sort of decline or entropic, and then the, the return one of it, it comes back in, in moments. Uh, but I was also thinking when, uh, when thinking of you were uh, queer theory, which I'm not super familiar with, but queer theory and temporality, when you think of somebody like um, Jose Esteban Munoz and, and queerness as this uh, horizon always on the future to come, uh, I was wondering if there was a way in which that, uh, that kind of, it, rather than um, uh, disability and sexuality interacting in moments of, of returning to the phallus, if it could also be theorized or conceptualized in a way in which um, the phallus, rather than something lost, is something always kind of heading toward. Uh, I think, for instance, to, to give a concrete example here, uh, J.G. Ballard's Crash, um, which may not be a perfect fit, but, but the sort of constant need of, of upgrading yourself through damaging yourself and through becoming more and more um, physically disabled uh, as a way of, of encountering this kind of perfect sexual moment. I wonder if that is, a, again, maybe not the world's greatest example, but a kind of um, uh, movement toward this, this queer phallic temporality. If, if that was, I, the, my question I suppose I should get to now is um, if that ever uh, has uh, come up in your, in your thinking of these alternative stories or this way of, of queering temporality and disability? It hasn't, okay. first of all. Never thought of J.G. Ballard's crash in relation to that. Never thought of the idea of, of kind of like gradually through disability building a phallus or building something ideal like that, um, which is maybe my, like my re last response. Um, so, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I think about that temporality and also whether I think that is a temporality of phallus and castration and also whether it's a temporality that works for the material I'm looking at, which is aging. Right, because that's what's really, really important is, is that um, uh, queer theory, when it's looked at aging, has only looked at child, adolescent, adult and has not thought about what happens to temporality beyond midlife, right? Um, so one of the things that I'm trying to think about is, and, and, and you know, we have the, there's a, lot, there's a lot of familiar ground to go over when you think about sexual temporality in child and adult. You have the developmental model, you have Freud's developmental model, the move from infantile to adult sexuality, right? But uh, that mood implies that sexuality stops in adulthood or it goes away after adulthood, you know. And, um, and it doesn't, right? It changes. And so, so I, I don't know what to do with that model because, because my goal is, to, is really thinking about aging and disability that is always resonant with aging. Yeah, thank you. Um, people are whispering. <laughs> I, just, I was just recalling a book that I remember seeing on, in the stacks of the library called Gay and Gray. Gay and Gray. Um, which I don't, and I, I But you've only said that, you haven't opened it. <laughs> you, it's this has nothing to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> now, now I should read it. Um, <laughs> just wondering, it's anecdotal, you said? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, you've talked about the decline, the effort to decline, and, and what's wrong with what's wrong with that kind of response. But I, 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 I'm, I'm disturbed by, by other people who want to reclaim uh, and restore. And, and I think it was Platt who said, talk about in that moment of a panic, fear of becoming a different person. What's wrong with being a different person? <laughs> I mean, Virginia Woolf once said uh, about the afterlife that it's dreary enough to be Peter or John or 
Mary all your life, but to think of all the years for eternity <laughs> and beyond endurance. That resonates with me. I mean, that, there, that, that one, one can, I mean, one of the things that I like about, for example, of Clifford Chatter is his entire different sexuality. And it is sexuality. It is just not the same thing. So this is an opportunity to become different. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's a, that, that was this, this kind of arc of decline, or also this kind of master narrative of we must keep control of our life, what's going on forever, or all that stuff. Well, and I, I think I, I think I basically agree with you. Whatever I mean, I'm I mean I'm 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 using figures like, I guess it's Platt. Who's I mean people have people people have several people have seized upon that verb reclaiming, um, uh, but I mean for me one of the things I love about Platt is her is is that moment of imagining her in a wheelchair hanging out with the motorcycle dykes, right? And that's a new identity for her. That's not where she was hanging out before she had a motorcycle. So. So, I mean, I think that what I would like to say is, yes, reclaiming sounds like a return, but she's clearly claiming a new identity. She's trying to figure out how to be a wheelchair femme, which was not an identity she had before. And, and that moment, I mean, the reason I love that moment, it's like, okay, like, we could resexualize this. Rather, rather than to have it turn into the loss of sexuality, we could, it would be the transfer, transformation. And I think that really there's a lot of, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in that and, and the way that that goes. That, I, th I think that I, I was sort of coming from queer theory, which is kind of where my work has been for a while, and coming from then the, the, the really insistent anti-normativity of queer theory when it crosses with disability studies. It's like, you know, like, right, like the, the, the embrace of the non-normative body and the embrace of the non-normative. I, I, I felt like that there was something really powerful about applying that to aging because people feel, speak about aging, about losing who they are rather than just becoming something different. And it's about, it's about the normal and the normativity and about the, the stability of that. So, so I don't know, but I, I, th I think that there's um, not a lot of difference between the position that I'm trying to take and the position you're trying to take, but I don't know. Oh, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, please uh, join me once again.